Meanwhile, back in Syria, what exactly are the planes targeting there? Well, first of all, the jihadist command and control centres, including their headquarters. Next comes fighter bases and training camps. The strikes also seek to disrupt the Islamist logistical operations by hitting their fuel and weapons depots. RT's Guy Nate Chichikan discussed the coalition's strategy with a top American military official. The Pentagon says they did not target specific individuals. They say they hit ISIS headquarters, buildings, training camps, and some combat vehicles. To talk about the strikes, I'm joined by Lawrence Wilkerson, a retired U.S. Army colonel, also Colin Powell's chief of staff at a time when the U.S. invaded Iraq 11 years ago. Sir, the Pentagon has provided video of the strikes as well as shots. This one is of the ISIS command control center. The Pentagon also says the strike started well after midnight, Syria time. Most fighters have probably gone home by then. Do you think the strikes were more for a show or r rather than to actually take out the fighters? I am rather puzzled at the exact hour of the hits and some of the targets that I've seen in the, in the target array. It doesn't make much sense to go after a group whose main power is their individual fighters in terms of a city-state. That is to say, hitting buildings, hitting communications complexes, training camps and so forth might make some sense, but it doesn't seem to be like it would be a devastating blow, so I am puzzled by it. Do you think that strikes have done the job of dispersing the terrorists rather than taking I them I think out? that's the tactic they're going to use now. That's the tactic I would use, and we've seen this repeatedly throughout the so-called global struggle against terror, is that when you use one tactic against them, air power in this case, they use a multiple number of tactics back against you. They will not allow themselves to be vulnerable to airstrikes. Then you have to drop a $2 million smart bomb or cruise missile on a single forehead. I mean, that's not very productive. The U.S. mission now is to target ISIS in Syria, but mission creeps have happened in the past, both in Iraq and in Afghanistan. What is the possible mission creep scenario I just, here? I can see it coming. The mission creep here is U.S. forces increasingly on the ground, first, as we are already doing, to advise Iraqi forces, and then ultimately, because the Arab forces won't do it or can't do it, U.S. forces grow and grow and try to do it. U.S. officials are preparing the public for a protracted campaign, possibly lasting years, and a lot of things can change in the meantime. In Washington, I'm Ganesh Chagan, RT. Well, let's now have a look at what actually led to the rise of Islamic State. The US-led intervention in Iraq in 2003, which toppled Saddam Hussein, saw the emergence of Sunni fundamentalists who inspired the later jihadists. Western backing of forces opposed to the regime of Bashar al-Assad in the civil war in Syria has also played into the hands of the Islamists. And support from some of the US's key allies in the region enabled the extremists to flourish in Syria and Iraq. Russia's Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov says the U.S. is now fighting the very organization it helped to create. Now that the Islamic State has been declared enemy number one by the United States, I'd like to remind you these are the same people that became strong and organized when they started receiving financial and other aid from abroad. During regime change in Libya and attempts to do the same in Syria, no holds were barred. America and Europe declared they were supporting the fight against inhumane regimes. When we drew attention to the fact that among the anti-government fighters there were a lot of extremists and terrorists, we were basically told that it's temporary and something to deal with after the regime is gone.